Welcome to the Bogleheads Chapter Series. This episode was jointly hosted by the Starting Out Life Stage and the South Florida Local Chapter and recorded August 10th, 2021. It features longtime Boglehead 5K discussing investment funding priorities, including investment locations and tax efficiency. Bogleheads are investors who follow John Bogle's investing philosophy for attaining financial independence. This recording is for informational purposes only and should not be construed as investment advice. Uh, with a presentation by 5K, I'm prioritizing the investment order. The Bogle Heads is a term intended to honor Jack Bogle. Mr. Bogle created the first index fund for retail investors and is the founder of Vanguard. But Bogle Heads are investors who follow or use the investing advice uh, that Mr. Bogle advocated. And that investing advice, as you know, is invest early and often develop your workable investing plan, never try to time the market, use index funds when possible, diversify, keep it simple, minimize taxes with cost-efficient investing, and above all, to stay the course with your plan, both in bull and bear markets, just keep saving and just keep investing. And this is where 5K's presentation tonight will be so useful, developing the plan. Um, I would also like to introduce my co-moderators tonight. We have Carol from the um, pre-retirement chapter and the uh, Dallas chapter. And we have Jim, who you just heard from Chicago. The, we talked about the recording of the meeting. When the presentation is over again, we will stop recording. We'll have a big question and answer. However, 5K, if he uh, wants to, he can answer questions. He has told us he will answer questions during his presentation if he doesn't feel it, it affects his flow of his presentation. So you can put your questions in the chat and uh, Carol and Jim will, or 5K will address those questions. Um, let me see. Thank you. I'd like to introduce Gail Cox, who is here. Gail is the Vogel head who created the Life Stage investing, the Life Stage chapter, chapters of the Bogleheads, and we thank her for that. Okay, on to our presentation. Uh, 5K is a longtime Boglehead who posts regularly on the forum. He has many, many helpful posts, is kind, competent, answering questions from newbies and oldies. We appreciate. And he's especially good on portfolio creation and tax efficient fund placement. He also has what his, his personal financial toolbox, which is a huge spreadsheet. And he has also already given a presentation on that and you can find it on the Vogelhead blog. I believe it was in March. Okay, 5K, welcome. And please, uh, the stage is yours. Thank you, Miriam. So everything that's going to be covered here verbally, pretty much you can find in various websites. Uh, the presentation will have links to all of those. Uh, the presentation itself will in PDF form be made available after the meeting. Um, and these are not my ideas as much as I'm just regurgitating what various groups of people have put together as these are some pretty good ideas that you might want to follow. Okay. So I'll just start out with some general comments. A lot of this is subjective. Uh, reasonable people can differ on the exact ordering. Now, you can stretch that, but you can't stretch that too far. Some of the things that you'll find at the top of the list, they, they belong there and you don't want to switch them with things at the bottom of the list. And we'll get to the lists shortly. Uh, sometimes the math is simple, but the equation values themselves are somewhat speculative. Like one example would be, what do you think future tax rates will be when deciding traditional versus Roth? And then and when we get into the risk versus reward, you know, there is no deterministic answer you can pay debt at a low known rate. You can invest at a possibly higher, but possibly lower rate. And we'll get into that a little bit also. 
And you know, other than the above, this is all straightforward and that should be a, a winking emoji there. So it's not straightforward, but it's simple enough. Okay, so the next, this slide and the next slide are very high level views. Uh, after these two slides, we'll get into the details on these, but this one is the picture view that you can see. I'm not going to read things. You can, you can read the slide faster than I can talk through it. There's some things that are high priority, things that are sort of in the middle, and then things that are relatively low priority. So that's, that's the picture view. You've got your emergency fund, your employer match, your high interest debt. Then you get into HSAs, IRAs, 401ks, you know, the whole alphanumeric lexicon. Then you get into the, the taxable accounts and the, the paying off debt. Uh, I mentioned you can find these things on the internet. There's a couple of lists. And, and again, we're going to get into details on this. So don't try to read the small print if, if you find it difficult. Um, the thing to note is all those green lines, they all match up. So the two particular lists that I'm most familiar with, the one in Bogleheads on prioritizing investments, and there's a Mr. Money Mustache one called, what is it, investment order. They, they pretty much say the same thing. They may say it in slightly different words. So if one of them confuses you, you know, try the other and it may, the wording may be different enough that it becomes understandable, but the concepts are identical. Okay, so without further ado, these are really the, the top three. And these are all listed more or less in, in order. So the top one would be the first thing to do and the next one, the second, and the third one, the third. But you can mix and match. So let me just go through these a little bit here. So the emergency fund, lots of, so when we talk about emergency fund, we'll talk about traditional versus Roth later. We'll talk about pay debt versus invest. Any one of these individual topics we could spend an hour or two on. So th this is a high level view. So the emergency fund to your satisfaction, you know, I'd, I think it's pretty non-controversial to say that you should give yourself at least enough buffer that you don't have to worry about bouncing checks from month to month. So you, you need at least the next month's bills in your emergency fund. You know, beyond that, do you need three months, six months, a year, two years? That's a personal thing. So to your satisfaction. Next one would be get the employer match. If you've got a 401k or 403b that's going to give you a, a one for one match or even a, a 50 cent per dollar match, that's the highest return you're gonna get. Now, even in the next point, you've got credit cards. Even if you're paying 20, 30%, interest on your credit cards, if you can get a one-for-one -one match from your employer, that's 100%. Um, but there is a reason why high interest debt, for example, credit cards uh, is, is very high on the list here. You know, high is, is somewhat relative. What's high for one person who's very risk tolerant, you know, might not be the same for someone who's more risk averse. There's no right answer. It's, it's personal finance. Um, and, and these mix and match. So if, let, take the emergency fund and the paying off the credit card debts. If you're sitting there with six months expenses in your emergency fund, but you owe $10,000 on a credit card that you're paying 25% per year interest on, um, you might call that credit card debt an emergency and dip into your emergency fund to wipe out the credit card debt. So if emergency funds are there to be used. So if you've got something that you think qualifies as an emergency, go ahead and use it. Now, if you're using your emergency fund to pay off your credit card every month, eh, that's a different story. Okay, so that's that's the top three. Let me just st stop here. If, there's any questions on those top three? Anything in, in the chat I, I saw was flipping by too fast for me to concentrate on as I was giving the presentation, but are, are there any open questions at this point? Okay. 
All right. Hearing none, going once, going twice. All right. We shall move on. So the middle four, uh, you can pay tax now, you can pay it later, you can pay it never on these four options here. So the first one, and the reason why it is the first one with a health savings account, if you're eligible for one, and again, we can get into gory details on what makes one eligible for a health savings account in terms of having a high deductible health plan. But if you're eligible, you get a tax deduction on your contribution, you don't pay tax, unless you live in what, California and is it New Jersey or just California, but uh, you don't pay tax on any gains. And then when you take it out to pay for medical expenses, you don't pay the tax on that. Somebody, okay, so it is California and New Jersey. Um, but the other 48, they're, they're a great deal. They're even a good deal in California and New Jersey. They're just not as great. Okay, so that's the one. Sometimes you hear them referred to as triple tax free. You get the tax deduction. You don't pay tax on, on annual gains, and then you don't pay tax if you take it out for medical expense. So then we get the next two, the, the traditional or Roth IRA and the employer plans. And again, remember with the employer plans, the, the top three uh, where the employer plan showed up, that was just up to getting the, the match, the maximum employer match. So, so this would be getting going up to the, the IRS limit, the 19,500 for 401ks. But the reason that the traditional or Roth IRA comes before the employer plans on this list and you see there's a double headed arrow, uh, so they, they can swap, but IRAs tend to have lower fees and almost by definition, they have more investing options. So if they have a lower fee than your 401k, your 403b offer, then go with the IRA first. But they don't always have lower fees. Sometimes you get institutional funds in 401ks and hey, just fill up the 401k. And sometimes you want to use the 401k because it can reduce your modified adjusted gross income for something like the earned income tax credit, whereas the IRA may not be as efficient at doing that. So you know, the, the IRA and the 401k, yeah, the default order is IRA first, but there's plenty of examples where you would want to do the 401k or 403b or 457 ahead of the IRA. And then you get into, for those who happen to have it available, you typically, if you work for a large company and you know, they offer a, an after-tax non-Roth 401k option, you can do something called the, the mega backdoor Roth process, which is a little bit different from the plain old backdoor Roth process you see in the second bullet point. But it does get after-tax funds into a Roth account instead of a taxable account, so that's a good deal. Uh, there was a comment, yeah, there's another example on MAGI of uh, healthcare subsidies. Uh, that may be another reason that you'd want to use a 401k in preference to an IRA. And all of these are if you have to make a choice. If you're in the wonderful position that you've got enough disposable cash that you can fill all these up, well then great. It doesn't, you know, the, the order doesn't really matter. Questions about that middle four or anything else at this point? Yes, I have a question 5K. Sure. On the mega Roth, you mentioned uh, the mega Roth. Can you explain yep. what that is? So, if you this is so, the mega backdoor Roth is something that goes through an employer plan, so a 401k, 403b. Most people are familiar with the concept you you can contribute to a traditional account in your 401k. And when I say 401k, just assume that I mean, or 403b. 
you can contribute to a traditional account or a Roth account. And those are, you can elect which one to do. There's a third option that some employers offer, not all, but some, and that is after-tax non-Roth. So you can contribute after tax, but it's not immediately going into a Roth account. And it sits there, it's like, um, it's like a non-deductible traditional IRA contribution. So that's nice, but not all that interesting unless the employer plan also allows you to take that non-deductible after-tax account and roll that over to either the Roth version of the, the Roth account within the 401k, or if the employer plan allows you to distribute that out to a Roth IRA. So you make this after-tax non-Roth contribution, where if you don't do anything with it, it just sits there. Um, you're not paying any tax on any gains while it's sitting there, but when you withdraw it, you now pay tax on the gains at ordinary income rates. Unless you have the option to take that account and roll it over immediately or you know, within a month or two or even a year into a Roth 401k or Roth IRA. And there's a whole, there's two uh, wiki entries, one on after tax 401k, one on the mega backdoor Roth process. So they're related, but not identical. Does that cover it in enough detail? Yes, but does that mean that the mega Roth dip, or the, it's a mega 401k, correct? Mega 401k Roth, that it differs from your regular 401k Roth, regular 401k, your regular Roth, 401k on the um, taxing of the earnings. Correct. So there's, where do I start? I'll start with the, the processes. So there's a backdoor Roth process, which involves multiple steps. And there's a mega backdoor Roth process that also involves multiple steps. But the two of them are, are different. The, the regular backdoor Roth process refers to what you do with IRAs. The mega backdoor Roth process refers to what you do with your 401k. So the process for both of them involves you make a non-deductible contribution. So it goes into an account, you did not get to deduct that contribution from your taxes, but if it stays in that account, while it grows, you won't be paying any taxes. But when you go to withdraw from that account, you'll pay tax at ordinary income rates on any gains. So up to this point, you know, if you put it in the account, you didn't get to deduct it, it's growing, you're not paying tax, but then when it comes out, you have to pay tax on any gains. Kind of interesting, but maybe not all that interesting. What makes it very interesting is if you can take that non-deductible amount and then convert it immediately to a Roth account. So when you do that conversion, if there hasn't been any gains, you're not going to pay any tax, but now you've got it into a Roth account where you'll never pay any tax on it. So you've got people sometimes say, you know, I'm going to put it in my backdoor Roth account, or I'm going to use my mega backdoor Roth account, which is playing a little fast and loose with the language. Those backdoor things are processes that involve a contribution to a non deductible account and then a conversion to a Roth account. Does the mega backdoor, does the mega backdoor Roth stay in your employer plan until you take it out and you roll it over to uh, 
a regular I, I, I IRA. Definite, is that correct? I'll give you a definite maybe on that one. Uh -huh. um, it, it depends on your employer's plan. Some employers allow you to roll it into a Roth, into your Roth 401k account. Some employers allow you to do what's called an, an in-service distribution, and you can get it out of the 401k completely and into a Roth IRA. Either one of those is perfectly fine. Um, it really doesn't matter as long as your employer plan allows you to do either one. Okay, thank you. I did. You're welcome. All right. Anything else on this before I move along? Okay, I think there was a question in the chat. Um, what tax bracket should you use a Roth 401k versus a regular 401k? Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> uh, let me go back to. So, you know, even when the math is simple, equation values may be speculative. It really, it doesn't matter what your current tax bracket is as much as it matters how does that compare to what you think your future marginal tax rate will be. Uh, you notice I use marginal tax rate instead of bracket, and I really should use that. It depends on what your current marginal tax rate would be, which for some people is their nominal bracket amount, but for others it's, it's not. You need to compare that to what you think it will be in the future. So we can go after I'm, so this presentation is mostly on the investment order. Um, we can certainly go into Roth versus traditional after this one is, is done. And as I said, that we can take at least an hour on that alone, but maybe we can keep it a little shorter than that. But there is no, I mean, there's, there's sort of rules of thumb, but I really don't like rules of thumb in traditional versus Roth because there's a huge number of exceptions to them. And one rule of thumb would be, well, if you're in the highest tax bracket, use traditional. Well, that's a great rule of thumb unless you're gonna stay in the highest tax bracket even after retirement, and then you should use Roth. Another decent rule of thumb is if you're in the 12% bracket or lower, you know, if you're in 12% bracket, use, use Roth. And that's a pretty good rule of thumb, unless this is someone who's late to the party and they're in their 50s and haven't had much saved and probably never going to pay tax in retirement. So they should use traditional. So uh, I, I just, I don't like rules of thumb because there's too many exceptions when it comes to traditional versus Roth. But again, that, that's a personal opinion. Okay, any other questions before I go on? All right. Okay, so now we're, we're kind of towards the bottom of, of the prioritization list and you know, we're taking care of the, the top ones, you know, get, your, get your house in order so that you're not bouncing checks and get that employer match, that 100% return on, on your investment get those credit cards paid off and, and we're through the, all of the tax advantaged options, the HSAs, the IRAs, the 401ks. Uh, so now we're down to, okay, do I invest or do I pay off debt that I have? Good question. Um, so in the, in the Bogleheads wiki, you'll see there's uh, three, three bullet points, pay off medium interest, then invest taxably, then pay off low interest. It's a little tough since there is no maximum on taxable investment. You could reasonably ask, how do you ever get to paying off low interest debt? That's a good question. Uh, you can think of those two maybe as, as parallel rather than one right after the other. And it gets into your, your risk tolerance or your risk aversion. Just how do you define things? So there's one definition of medium interest debt that you'll find over on the, the money mustache one. And again, it's just a definition, 3% uh, over the 10 year treasury note yield, which 10 year treasury has been what about one and a quarter percent averaging over the past year. So I might say medium would be over four and a quarter percent. So 
you know, that would say 5% would be medium interest debt and you ought to pay that off. And 4% should be, that would be low interest debt. So you should invest taxably. And some people would say, yeah, that makes sense. Other people would say 5%, man, that's, that's pretty low. I, I, I think I'm gonna earn more than that. I'm in this for the long haul. I'm, I'm 100% stocks, away I go. Other people would say 4%, gee, that's a great return. That's a guaranteed investment return. I'm, I'm all for that. I'm gonna pay off the debt before I invest. And so it's, it's personal. But these are some of the things that you might wanna think about you know, when, when you're making your personal decision. Uh, other considerations that often pop up with questions, a common question is where, where do you put saving for a house down payment in this, this ordering? That's really up to you. Uh, you can either say, hey, this we really want a house. We're going to consider this a day-to-day -day expense like going out and buying groceries, you know, food, clothing, and an eventual better shelter. So you know, we will do that. That's That's just something that we're not going to consider that an investment that's at risk. You know, we're going to go you know, buy chicken and potatoes and, and milk, and then we're going to put a bunch into our down payment fund. Or people could say, you know, we're okay. Yeah, we're renting here, or we've, we've got an okay house, and we're, we'll invest. And if things work out, uh, we'll take money out of investments later and, and uh Buy a, buy a house or buy a bigger house, but no, we're in no rush. So again, that's either one of those is perfectly defensible. Another question is where do 529 plans come into this? That's another personal thing. I kind of like the analogy of do that only after your, your retirement plan is set. Get your own oxygen mask on, then go assist others. Uh, Another phrase that I've, I've heard is you can borrow for college, but you can't borrow for your retirement. Uh, but that's a personal thing. Some people consider it extremely important to be able to pay their, their kids college. So you, you have that as a higher priority. And in all this, the, the ordering pretty much assumes that you've got W-2 earnings or, or you're, a, you know, you're a contractor without, you know, you're, you don't own um, capital. So you don't own a chain of dry cleaning stores or you don't own a food truck that you're looking to grow your business. If you are self-employed in, in that way, if you own your own business, you really need to look and figure the return on, on your business investment and decide where that fits in uh, with all the investment options of IRAs and solo 401ks and so forth and so on. And that is it for the formal presentation on prioritizing investments. So where are we with questions? I see some warm ones here. Chat um, asking, what's a reasonable amount to put per month into a 529 for young kids? Um, I, you know, it, there is, I don't have a good answer for that. If someone wants to opine on that, uh, you know, that depends. Do you, is your kid going to go to Harvard and you want to pay for all four years plus a PhD and, you know, in whatever? Uh, then you'd need to be putting in a heck of a lot. Um, you know, is your kid going to go to enormous state university and is likely to get a, some sort of athletic scholarship? Uh, you know, you probably don't need to put in as much. Uh, that, that's a really personal one. I, I don't have a good answer to that. If anyone does, uh, raise your hand or open your mic and I'll, I'll be quiet for a bit here. Well, one thing I would say is that the earlier you put the money into the 401k, the more time it has to grow. 
And so it's kind of like a front loading. I, I view it as kind of a front loading uh, effort to put as, I mean, I realize that saving for retirement is important, more important, but if, if there's any way to front load the, fi the 529 early, then um, it has more time to grow. It only has 18 years to grow. The life of the 529 is shorter than the life of your retirement, uh, your uh, investing for retirement. So it's kind of like a different type of an account. It sort of behaves a little different. But most of the 529 plans do have a like a glide path similar to a target date refund, a target date retirement fund, where it will glide down to bonds. So if you put your money in, if you intend to put more money in towards the end of the 18 year period, you're going to be in a more conservative portfolio or you're going to take more risk that the market will drop before your child goes to college. So I see a, um, a reason to front load it as much as you can. Yeah, there was a there's a long post about uh, after tax money choice between regular taxable account and mega backdoor Roth and uh, RB suggests it's always better to use mega backdoor Roth and I would agree with that. Um, that's why you know it shows up in this middle four as opposed to the the bottom three. So yeah. I, we talked about you can sort of flip flop some of these, but I think that top three, there's there's a pretty bright line between the top three and the middle four. And there's a pretty bright line between the middle four and the bottom three here. I, I suppose someone might be able to come up with an exception, but I can't off the top of my head. Uh, what else do we have in chat? 529s, 529s. Okay, there's another question I can read out if you want. Um, it's saying, it's from Deepak. He said, um, my, my state 529 plan has a state tax deduction. I thought of this as a guaranteed return on my investment and hence prioritize it a little higher in my taxable accounts. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Um, yeah, that, that's, if, if, you, if, if you're sure and you get to define the word sure, if you're sure that your kid's gonna to go to college and you're gonna spend and you want to spend the money on that, sure, no, that, that makes sense to do that. Um, I have to, you know, what we've done personally, uh, well, we, we weren't really all that, we, we were lucky with what we did on, on our personal finance, um, worked out okay, but we didn't really know what we were doing. Um, but what we do now with, with kids still going through college is uh, we put in the, the maximum 529 that we can to get the state tax break. And, and then we take it right out the next year to, to use it for tuition and, and room and board. So yeah, the, the, if you're in a state that gives you a state tax break, uh, might as well take advantage of it. And a while back, there was a question in the chat. If you don't plan to retire in the U.S., how does this any of this change, if at all? Uh, great question. And, and that would probably depend on where you're going to retire and how that country treats IRAs and 401ks in the U.S. And I am absolutely not an expert on those, not even close to being moderately informed on those. So someone else will have to weigh in on that. Okay, I actually had a question as well. You know, what if, um, you know, you sort of have um, low to medium interest debt somewhere in between, uh, you know, say like two and a half percent, you know, and, and you know, you, you weren't really sure how things were going to kind of go in the future. Would you focus on paying off the debt or investing, or um, I guess, how, how would you make that decision if you really were unsure as to the, the trade-off there? Well, one, you could follow these suggestions and a, a you know, two and a half percent, it, the, the Bogleheads Wiki does not define high, medium, and low. The Money Mustache one gives 
some suggestions, but I don't think it even pretends that those are holy writ suggestions. There, there's some guidelines. So if we were to go with the definition of medium as being 3% over the 10 year treasury note yield and at one and a quarter percent roughly. So medium would be four and a quarter percent. So you said two and a half percent. So that's under four and a quarter. So that would be not medium interest debt. That would be low interest debt. And if you follow this ordering, you'd, you'd, you'd never pay it off until you paid it off by paying it monthly. But if you're staying up at night because you can't stand debt and you're losing sleep, well, then maybe you'd want to pay it off. Can I contribute something to that point as well? Sure. Uh, it's, it's rather helpful if you simplify the debt question. So for instance, if you're paying two and a half percent in interest on any form of debt, you can also look at that as a way to give yourself a two and a half percent raise on your income by eliminating that debt. Furthermore, if you plan to invest while carrying the example two and a half percent debt, and let's say you're receiving a nominal, which is pre-inflation return, say 4%, you're not really receiving that 4% because if you're paying two and a half percent on debt, but receiving 4%, you could do the math and you, you tend to be spinning your wheels. So it's always prudent to pay off the debt first and then jump into investing to maximize that, those efforts. That's, that's one way to look at it. Um, you know, other people could say that they're, they're not investing in bonds at all and they expect their stock returns to be higher. So it's, you know, never say always, or how does that go? Unless there's something I'm missing. Uh, it, but if you take someone who's decided they want to be 100% stocks and they're, they're saying that the expected return is higher and then they're willing to run the risk that that expected return does not materialize, then I, I think that they have made a defensible choice to not pay off their debt. David Gravener has a question. 5K, were you finished? Yeah, yeah. Okay, David, do you have a question? Okay, uh, Christina, do you have a question? Yes, I'm wondering, I also put it in the chat, but I'll just go ahead and um, state it here. I'm wondering, as you move closer to retirement, should you consider moving most of your money into an after-tax account so that you're not quote unquote surprised by the taxes you're paying when you're drawing down from pre-tax accounts like 401k or you know traditional um, IRAs? I, I, I think the answer is, is in your question and that would be, don't be surprised. Um, you might want to do Roth conversions um, or you might not. Uh, while you're still working, it's usually not beneficial to do Roth conversions because now your Roth conversion amount is being added on top of your salary or your wage income. And so you're gonna pay a pretty high marginal rate usually. So, right, but doesn't a Roth conversion assume like, I'm, I, and excuse my ignorance here, but doesn't a Roth conversion already assume that you're you're making a certain amount of money? So I'm I'm working from the point of view that you're not making so much money that you can do, you know, some sort of mega backdoor or Roth that you just basically have some basic investments in, you know, traditional retirement accounts like a four hundred one k or what have you, and you're putting all your money in, into that, but perhaps as you move closer to retirement, 
you know, when you start to draw down from that 401k, you're going to be paying taxes on that, or you're going to be paying taxes on your traditional IRA. So at what point, I'm wondering, should you be trying to move money or should you, maybe it's not about moving money, maybe it's just simply about putting money now into, let's say, a Roth account of some sort. Yeah. I'm just really trying to figure out, like, how do you avoid paying taxes you don't need to pay? If that and, makes sense. And, and that would be that you, you learn enough to understand your own personal tax situation. Um, there's, there's lots of ways to do it. You know, if you use, you can pay a CPA to tell you. Um, you could use TurboTax and, and you can you know, say, well, okay, here's what it would be. Here's my base. And now if I were to do a thousand dollar Roth conversion, how much more tax would I pay? And, you know, what's that divided by a thousand? So what's my marginal rate on that? And, you know, so forth and so on. Uh, you can use spreadsheets that will do all those calculations for you and give you a, a chart that'll show you what your marginal rate would be for your Roth conversion. So the whole the the whole thing on on Roth conversions or traditional versus Roth it, it boils down to um, it's the where is it here? You really want to understand the rate that you're going to pay. So with a a Roth conversion, if you're, if it's going to cost you 24% to do a Roth conversion now, but you expect after you retire, you can take money out of your traditional account and only pay 15%, then wait. If it's going to cost you 12% to take your money and do a Roth conversion now, and you expect after retirement, you're going to have a pension kick in and you're going to start Social Security. So you're going to be paying 22.2%. Then don't wait, do that conversion now at, at 12%. So it, it really, it, it's a, it matters what your situation is, what your tax rate is going to be now and what you think it's going to be later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Or, I, I, I'm sorry that, that I can't give a, you know, a cut and dry answer. What I can say, Christina, is that for me, for our family, we were surprised when we retired that we were in a higher tax bracket than when we were working. And we did not expect that. But life has its way of um, you know, changing your tax expectations. We have pensions and also uh, RMDs. And then uh, my husband went back to work with 401k, with, with um, I'm sorry, W-2 uh, wages. And before you know it, we're back up in a higher tax, we're in a higher tax bracket than when we worked. So uh, there are many Bogleheads who did find that. I read them on the forum. And also many Bogleheads are in more or less the same tax bracket just more or less the same tax bracket when they retire as when they were working. Um, Thank you, Miriam. That's very helpful because what you just described is what I'm, what I'm talking about. It's what like you're looking you at. Change. Exactly. So that was very helpful. Thank you. It's like you can try to plan, but I mean, I'm not quite at or near retirement yet, but you thought you were doing all the things you needed to do and then yet you get in retirement and it's like surprise, surprise. So that's helpful. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Also, David Grabener, are you unmuted now? Yes, I'm unmuted. Okay, you're yeah, on. I, I, I want, yeah, I, I wanted to clarify the way, um, the way to look at the, um, at the uh, paying down a debt versus investing a decision. Uh, okay. So, um, so I, I, it's, um, it's, 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 it's try to take an objective look at, at, at this. So if you pay down a, if you pay down a loan, you're getting a risk-free return equal to the rate on the loan. Uh, and so, so you have to decide, uh, would you rather get a risk-free return equal to the rate on the loan or the rate on your investments? Well, if you hold a bond, you're getting 
a low risk return equal to the rate on the bond. Uh, so that's a, um, so that's uh, that I think is uh, uh, five case point about if you're hundred percent stock, then um, then uh, then it might well make sense to hold uh, to hold a debt that's sufficiently above your bond rate. You'd rather get a uh, you'd rather invest in stock and expect seven percent with a lot of risk than get a risk free three percent. But if you hold if you hold a stock if you hold a bond yielding two percent and a loan at three percent. Then, if you sell the bond to pay off to pay down the loan, you're getting a guaranteed one percent benefit without changing your risk. So, unless there's some other reason you wanted, um, so if you have any bonds at all, then paying uh, unless there's some other reason, and there may be, uh, you may you may need to keep the money liquid. Uh, it's often better to, it's usually better to max out your 401k rather than paying down a mortgage because you get taxed for growth for the long time. But I, I think that that's the point I tend to make on the forum that if you are actually 100% stock and you're, then you, then it may make sense to borrow at a lot more. Uh, to, to borrow more than at, at significantly above the bond rate. If you, but if you hold any bonds, you, you can view your mortgage as a negative bond. Uh, and um, and therefore paying down the mortgage is a better is a better kind of quote bond to buy mm -hmm. uh, that um, if its rate is if its rate significantly higher and if you can pay down the and if you don't get any other benefit like liquidity and I, liquidity is useful but I, I but um, I I I don't think it's um, uh, on the form, I don't. I think unless you're 100 percent stock, I would certainly pay down a mortgage that's three percent above the treasury yield. Thank uh, you, David. And, and this that's covered pretty well in the the paying down loans versus investing yep. wiki article, yep. which that's where it's linked. Here. Yeah, uh, yeah, um, yeah. I, I've I've actually just um, I, I'm one of the main contributors to that article, uh, so I. That's, that's why I made sure it to does show. Up. It does show my. Uh, it does show a lot about what I, how I think about the problem. Yep, no, I, I think it's well written. 5K, does it depend on the type of debt? Like, a, um, what about student loans, paying off student loans rather than investing for retirement? That is often uh, discussed on the forum that, um, no. I, I suppose it, it could. Um, that's that's getting to be a really sharp pencil there to make distinctions. And that that is that you can get into callable versus non-callable and you know all that sort of stuff. But I, I think if we're going to stick with the Boglehead principle of simplicity, let's just say that is that. Absolutely. And then one other thing I'd like to add to on the topic. I think often gets overlooked because a lot of people start comparing the different rates, you know, carrying debts versus investments. It really boils down to cash flow. If you're carrying debts, right, not only are you paying an interest rate on that borrowed amount of funds, but you're also servicing that debt. And therefore, that cash flow is flowing out of your expense column rather than staying in your asset column. And so the more money that you're paying out servicing debts of, say, credit cards, student loans, car payments, X, Y, Z, just let's just call it consumer debt. That's less money that you're contributing to your investment efforts and therefore a smaller nest egg at retirement. Now, obviously there's no perfect plan. And, and, and as previously mentioned, there is never a, a rule of thumb, but it, it's worth considering that paying money out in terms of cash flow to service debts is money that you're not investing. And so one should seriously consider that opportunity cost. Oh, thank you, Michael. Mm -hmm. Carol, do you have a uh, question? Yeah, there was a question in the chat a while back and I know this is kind of like a whole other topic, but the question was what assets should go in a Roth versus a traditional IRA versus taxable account? And I know that's a big question. <laughs> Well, I'll give the one or two sentence answer. And again, there's a, there's a whole wiki article that goes into pros and cons and conflicting opinions. But the, the one or two sentence answer is uh, you put your high expected growth things in your Roth, your low expected growth, like 
bonds in your traditional and you know taxable uh, you try to make that as tax efficient as possible so that that's my quick answer but uh, anyone else is certainly welcome to chime in yeah it's also <laughs> worth uh, noting that bonds pay interest but you're typically taxed at marginal rates and therefore, in some of Bogle's books, he uh, definitely highlights and mentions some of the potential uh, benefits of placing fixed income within uh, Roths, which are uh, obviously a post-tax contribution. So the interest earned on those bonds within your Roth as it compounds over many decades is a serious advantage because you're not paying uh, any taxes on those uh, interest payments. Right. So this this is John. I, I'm the one that posed the question. I, I, I struggle with the question of what to put in my Roth account because it, those are a, a finite amount of assets. I mean, it's not as large as my taxable or my 401k. So I, I'm trying to be choosy about what I put in my for on my Roth account. And so I struggle between, you know, like you mentioned, higher growth stocks, but we also have things that pay, you know, pretty good dividends that I don't necessarily want to pay taxes on, like a high yield uh, junk bond fund or uh, a Verizon, for instance, uh, that pays, you know, four and a half percent dividends. So that, that, that's just my struggle. And I just retired. So that's my that's my context. Well, congratulations. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Then there's a right under that. There's a question on Mega Backdoor Roth. Currently, Vast Roth also offered funds. I have a 401k. Taxes are paying on the gains. Oh, don't worry about being confused. To join join the crowd on that. The whole whether it's a regular backdoor or a mega backdoor, mega backdoor, they they can get confusing. Um, so what you would need to understand is, do you have a third option? in your 401k. So you have the traditional pre-tax, you have the Roth that goes in after tax, and you need, you need to find out if your employer also offers after tax non-Roth. That's, that's the first step. So does your employer, so you can contribute up to 19.5, uh, or if you're older, some more, uh, to either the traditional or the Roth. But then there's that $58,000 limit that's employer contributions and the 19.5 and, and anything else that you kick in. So that's where the after-tax non-Roth comes in that if your employer you know, hasn't matched you 2X or whatever, uh, you still have this room. If your employer allows you to put in after-tax non-Roth, you can do that. And then you need to, so that's step one. Step two is, does your employer also allow you to then immediately or in the relatively near future, allow you to take that contribution and roll it over into a Roth account, either inside the 401k or out to a Roth IRA? So it's a, it's a two-step process and you need to check with your employer on whether both of them are allowed. If I can just to add that quick question there. Um, I think someone had also asked in terms of the gains um, before the mega backdoor is completed, um, I, I believe you, you'd pay taxes on those gains, is that correct? Oh yes, okay, yep. Uh, taxes are paid on the gains, that's correct. So, you know, if, if it's gone up by $25, you know, because you waited a month, you're going to pay tax on that $25, but I wouldn't let that hold you back. Okay, sounds good. It sounds like the best way to really find out about that is to contact your employer and mm -hmm. your plan. Okay, that makes sense. And I think there's another question in the chat asking, um, does the sale of rental property, um, for capital gains on that rental property, affect the distribution of from IRAs on your tax return? Okay, hang, hang on to that one. Let me just check with Gail of North Texas. Did that answer your question? She's probably yes, being... thank you. Okay, thank you, great. David. Okay, sorry, Manny. What what was the one about the the capital gains? Oh, sure. Uh, they were the person was asking. Um, does a sale of a rental property uh, capital gain affect the distribution from IRAs on your tax return? Um, let 
Well, it depends. So if you've got a capital gain, if you're in one of those those zones where your capital gains aren't not being or not being completely taxed, or you know you're hitting the NIIT boundary, and so they're going to be taxable more. If you're in one of those, then additional ordinary income gets taxed at a higher marginal rate. Um, otherwise, no. So that's another one of those it depends answers. Does that make sense? And if it does make sense to everyone, I'm amazed because it's not something that's obvious. Sounds like it's a complicated uh, answer, but um, yeah, I think that that makes sense to me. I, I just mentioned in the chat the presentation you gave us um, at Chicago a few months ago where you used the financial toolbox. That was a really good thing to play around with some numbers to see the financial impact and the tax consequences and marginal rates, effective rates, all that. So I put the link in the in the notes here in the chat. And if we have some time tonight, I, I could. Five K, I think you put yourself on mute. Um... Sorry, that was me. Sorry. Oh. Oh, okay. Um, all right, I'm not not sure what got muted. Okay, that's fine. Five um, K, would you say that our young investors should aim, or it would be good, to arrange their order, their their um, investing? so that when they reach retirement, they are pretty much have a nice pot of money in their pre-tax, a nice pot of money in their after-tax Roths, and money also in their taxable account. It really depends on what their marginal tax rate has been through their employment. Um, and this is, it's a common question. People say, well, what, what, what percentage should be in which bucket? And it's really not the, the best, the percentage is a consequence, not a goal. So the goal is you want to fill up your traditional account up to, but no higher than, uh, you want to fill it up by by saving as you put into your traditional account. You're saving some certain marginal rate, twelve percent, twenty two percent, you know, whatever. If you're in the earned income tax credit area, you, you know, you can be saving a, a high marginal rate. You know, if you're paying NIIT, you can be paying, you can be saving a higher marginal rate, etc. You want to keep filling up that traditional account by saving at whatever marginal rate you're saving at until it gets large enough that you think that when you start to withdraw from that traditional account, you're going to be paying somewhere close to that same marginal rate. So if you've got someone that's making you know, relatively low income, they may end up with 90% of, of their investments in traditional because they're going to be pulling it out at a fairly low marginal rate. Where you know you take someone, you got a brain surgeon who's making half a million a year, whatever, um, it, they're gonna have a relatively small amount in traditional because they can only put so much in there. Um, and they're gonna have a whole bunch in taxable and, and Roth because it's spilled over. So I, I can understand why people want a percentage because that's a nice, easy thing to look at, but it's really the percentage should be an outcome, not a goal. We actually have a question in chat on that. It says, is there such a thing as too much money in a Roth versus traditional IRAs? In other words, if I only have Roth funds with no more traditional IRA funds, 
Aren't I wasting some of my efficiency? Yeah, if you have if you have everything in Roth, and then I mean everything, so you're not paying any tax at all in retirement, then yeah, you missed a bet. You should have you should have made some traditional contribution and saved taxes back at that point. Uh, Sonia, do you have a question? Sonia, you're on mute. No, sorry, it's a mistake. Okay. No, I think five key. Someone else had a question in the chat. Um, any thought on placing similar asset allocation funds in tax and tax deferred accounts? It wouldn't be 100% tax efficient, but uh, you'd avoid behavioral issues and you'd get automatic rebalancing. Um, and what are your thoughts about that? Um, and the other advantage that they pointed out was you might be able to do a similar amount withdrawal across all accounts when you need to spend in retirement. That's a, a trade-off between simplicity and optimization. And both of those are somewhat subjective. You know, one person's simple is another person's complex and one person's optimum is another person's not worth it. Um, I, I can't improve on the pros and cons in the uh, uh, tax efficient investment wiki. Thanks. And Doug, I, I mean, just to follow up on that, I'm curious, has anyone actually looked at like, you know, what are the percent differences, you know, in, you know, um, for instance, accounts, if you did that versus doing something that's more tax efficient, like how much of a difference does that make at retirement time? I'll, I'll let anyone else who wants to weigh in on that one. Manny, could you ask your question again? Was it your question or a question from the chat? Uh, it is my question. I was just more curious based off that question. But, you know, essentially, you know, the, the, they were saying, you know, simplicity versus more complexity. You know, if you had um, similar asset allocation in tax and tax deferred accounts, um, versus doing a more tax efficient asset allocation. What's the actual difference in retirement? Like what's the percent difference you might have um, in the amount you're able to withdraw you know, in retirement? Are you talking about tax efficient by putting, are you talking about stocks versus bonds in your tax, in your um, pre-tax versus your uh, Roth? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you were to, you know, rather than just putting similar asset allocations across tax and tax deferred, exactly, to, to put them in a more tax efficient manner. Um, so it wouldn't be, you wouldn't be accumulating tax drag. Uh, I can, I'm, even when I was working, my Roth account, I had mostly stocks. And the reason was I wanted it to grow because it was my account I was anticipating to be used for um, health reasons for, since we do not have, um, uh, we don't, we have health insurance, but we don't have long-term care insurance. And so I was, wanted it to be big for that. And also to leave to the kids. Um, it, I simply wanted it to grow. I could not get over it just seemed to me that it was tax free. All the growth in my Roth IRA was tax free. It was just going to grow and grow and grow. And it just seemed to me, I just could not get over how it would grow big if I had a lot of taxes, a lot of stocks in there for what I needed in the long term future. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, no, that, that makes sense. And, and I was really wondering, like, what is the actual difference in retirement? You know, if someone didn't do that and they put, you know, uh, taxes, like equities and bonds in their um, tax protected accounts, like what would the actual difference be? But it sounds like it'd be, it's beneficial really, or it could be beneficial to, to leave stocks in those tax deferred accounts. And Jack Bogle's Guide to Investing book, 
there was a chapter near the back of the book somewhere. I actually have it here in my library where he does a small little uh, breakdown of exactly what you're asking and does a comparison of putting X amount of dollars in a taxable account and then taking the same amount of dollars and putting it in a tax deferred or advantage account. Additionally, whether you select equities or bonds and what the resulting investment total would be at the end considering tax drag that you're referencing. So I don't know if you can get your hands on that book, um, but I think that may point you in the direction to what you're asking. I you're talking tax drag from a taxable account, Michael, is that right? Not from, not the tax drag that comes or the taxes that you pay when you withdraw from your uh, traditional 401k or tr your traditional IRA, right? You're talking about a taxable account versus a, a a traditional IRA or a traditional 401k? Yeah, I was just trying to reference that chapter in the book that may have oh, okay. helped the gentleman ask him the question if it if it may have, you know, helped clarify his question. It, it just came to mind because what he was asking seemed to be similar to what I recall reading in that chapter of uh, uh, Boglehead's Guide to Investing book. Thank you. 5K. Uh, let's see. Question about I bonds, with which I am not familiar. So, if someone would like to weigh in on Epoch's question on I bonds, okay. um, 5K. I do have another question on teachers and 403b plans mm -hmm. uh, we do have many teachers on the bogleheads and i know that they have uh, a weird setup with their 403b plans how does that fit into your investing priorities should they like you know abandon mm -hmm. get out of them if they really could and move into roths and traditional they also have annuities which sometimes are not uh, the best investment for them. There's one, I know there's a link in the Money Mustache one. I'm not sure if there's a link in the wiki. If, if there's not, I'm sure we could put it in there, but it goes something like, uh, you know, if you have, if you have uh, poor choices in your 401k, um, and it refers people to the Bogleheads wiki article on how do you decide how, how poor is too poor? And if David Grabener could, could go into more details on that, but uh, there's, there's some calculations you could do. You know, there was a recent thread where someone was paying, I think a total of about 0.3% in their 401k, or maybe it was a 403b. And they thought that this, this was terrible. And you know, while it's not as good as a 0.04% you know, for a 401k or a 403b, it's by no means terrible. If you're getting up into two and three percent, um, you know that that can be terrible, and especially with teachers who may stay with the same school district for a long time. Uh, but yeah, that's that's just something that they need to look at. Just how bad is it? And sometimes ninety percent of the funds are really terrible, but there's a there's a Vanguard S and P five hundred one in there that the salesmen never tell you about, but if they look closely, they can see it or, or something similar. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Mega Man, are you, you have a question? Yes, I wanted to um, circle back to the Roth versus traditional IRA. And the question was, uh, is, there, is it possible to have too much in the Roth? And I think the answer is yes. Um, if you got 100%, you're losing tax efficiency at some point. I've got about 70% in my Roth and I'm retired for 10 years. So we're really, it's nice to have both because it gives me great flexibility for taxes, especially in when you look at the tax brackets, um, there's a jump at from 12% to 22% tax 
whether you're making, and that's if you're making 20,000 a year up to 81,000, you're paying just 12% tax. So that's a 10% spread. So I can, I can uh, use my taxable funds up to the 81,000. And then if, and then I can, if I need more, I can just take it from my Roth. So I can, you know, 300, 400,000 for that year, I can take out of my, um, my Roth. So I think in those particular, that bracket is 8% or 10% spread. And then the spread from 173,000, this is joint uh, married couples, up to 330,000, that's a 24% bracket up to a 32% bracket. So that's an 8% spread. So if you're in that bracket, you'd take your traditional up to the 173 and pay 24%, but use Roth uh, money that you, if you need more beyond that, because you don't want to be in the 32% bracket. So that's what I like is, is keeping, a, keeping the bracket and I know where my tax is going to be. And I have the flexibility because I have a lot of Roth and, um, and I also have traditional. Interesting. Done. Thank you. Sure. 5K, you have comments on that? Um, I agree. <laughs> And I see that Lady Geek has put the link to the expensive or mediocre choices and some I bond as well. So I, I love it when there's a good person filling in the answers in chat. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, could you go over 5K, um, what the difference is between tax brackets and marginal tax rate and how uh, young investors who are you know don't want to learn who do, who do not want to get into the weeds of taxes but they want to just you know as, create their portfolio a simple portfolio do they have to worry about marginal tax rate versus bracket can they just look at their tax bracket and they'll be pretty safe in assessing their uh, portfolio or their investments and where to put them probably I mean, the, the whole Roth versus traditional thing, we're just nibbling around the edges on, on that anyway. It, you know, if, if someone's going to agonize over Roth versus traditional, they should just invest and flip a coin. So the, the short answer is, yeah, they can just use their, their tax brackets. Um, but you did ask about young investors. So I'm going to make the perhaps unwarranted assumption that if you're talking about a young person, um, they can handle a spreadsheet. So let me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show how, how easy it can be. So let me, so, okay, so if we're gonna do a young, so let's say we've got a young married couple and they're both 35. Uh, can people see this spreadsheet? Yes, is this your personal uh, toolbox spreadsheet? Yeah, it's, it's the one, it's, as, as I've said, I can answer probably most questions about it and detailed questions go back to the Money Mustache Forum where it's hosted there, but yeah, I can probably answer any beginner questions about it. Um, I, I find it a very useful tool. So, okay, so we've got, so we've got married. Um, oh, let's say they've got uh, two kids. Um, they're both under 18. Um, yeah, they're both under 13. One of them's under six and yeah, they both qualify for earned income credits. That depends on what kind of, Earning. So let's see. Let's say we've got one of them's making, gosh, I don't know, $60,000 a year. The other one's making $40,000 a year. Um, and they want to know if they make 401k contributions, how much is that going to 
save them. So so they are they are firmly in the twelve percent bracket. So if if all they knew was that they were in the twelve percent bracket, um, you know that would have been fine because they they are so firmly within that that you know if they both contribute the maximum to their four hundred one k, then they they get down and they just reach the first tier of the savers credit, but because they had to put over $30,000 in there, you know, just to reach the first tier of the savers credit, it really doesn't change their marginal rate very much at all. They're still at 12%. So if you've got someone in that situation, they say, I'm in the 12% bracket, I'm going to, I'm going to roll the dice and figure this is the lowest tax rate I'm ever going to pay, and they go all Roth, that's a defensible choice. Um, but let's change things a little bit around here. Let's say you know, one of them decides, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to go on. Uh, it's a little hard for me to see the uh, box of changing. If you could just mention what, what you're changing when you, when you just. Sure. Okay. So, so we, I had it set up. So I'm in the upper left here that one of them was making 60,000. The other was making 40,000. Uh, over here, they've got a couple of kids. Um, one of them's under six and one of them's not, you know, say one of them's five, the other's 10, whatever. Um, and so this was their only income and they were, they wanted to know what should they do with their 401k? Should they do traditional or Roth? Um, well, in that case, they're in the 12% bracket. They are firmly in the 12% bracket. So I'm down here looking at the chart and it's 12%. You know, no matter how much they contribute to the 401k, except for that one little blip where they hit the first tier of the savers credit, they're, they're smack in the 12% bracket. So now let's say the one that was making 60,000 says, well, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go back to school for two years to get a, a better nursing degree or whatever. So that drops out. Well, now that changes things a bit. You know, now you've got someone that, good grief, they're, they're in the they're in the earned income tax credit zone now. So uh, you know they're they're saving more than fifty percent. I'd I'd have to change the, the scale here. So. Whatever. So they're they're actually, you know, if they could afford it. Now this gets into, can can they afford it? So now only one of them can can possibly contribute. But uh, let let's say you know maybe they they received an inheritance and uh, bemoan the fact that they got the inheritance, but now they got it. They've got this cash that that they can live off for a couple of years while one of them goes back for a better de degree. Well. You know, you might think that they're in the in earning forty thousand dollars. They're in the bottom of the twelve percent or top of the ten percent, even. But because of the earned income tax credit, they can actually save eighty percent on at least some amount of traditional contribution. So that they ought to do. You know, here they ought to take a twelve. They ought to take a traditional contribution, and you know, maybe up to five thousand dollars. They do all traditional, um, and they're still at, at twenty percent, which is you know maybe they go traditional, maybe they go they go Roth. That that's but eighty percent they should do traditional, and then you know, when once they get up to contributing fifteen thousand, well they're not paying any tax, they're not getting any credit. They should they should put it all in Roth. So that's a a quick it depends answer. To your question about can they just go by tax bracket or do they need to look at marginal rate? But the point of using a tool like this, it's, it's just very, very fast to get a quick look at what the marginal rates are. And for someone who's 92 years old and has never used a, a spreadsheet, I, I wouldn't suggest this. 
but you know, someone in their 20s or 30s and they use spreadsheets in college, uh, they ought to be able to handle something like this. I've K did a presentation on this spreadsheet, the personal financial toolbox. I think it was in March um, for the Chicago chapter and it is on the Vogelhead's um, virtual presentation list. Yep. I believe it. I believe it's all there. And as I'm, I'm looking in in the chat, yeah, the answer to all the questions, recent questions, are are yes. This, whether it's personal finance toolbox and or the case study spreadsheet, it's it's the same thing. It, okay. And it is also in our wiki in the, I think, is it in the tax efficient fund placement wiki or the? It, it's in the tools and calculators. Tools wiki. and calculations wiki. Okay. Yep. Yep. Uh, 5K, is there a, or is there a time at which a point at which the taxes you have paid to convert a traditional to a Roth are outpaced by your earnings in the Roth that are now tax-free. What point would that be? How would we see that? Um, that sounds like a, a return on investment thing. And I know that's a, a, a hot, topic these days. Personally, I don't get the whole return on investment idea of, of analyzing traditional versus Roth. I mean, you have to pay tax. You either pay it now or you pay it later, or your heirs pay it now, or, or your heirs are going to pay it later. Or if you leave it to a charity, no, you know, it's no one's going to pay tax. But it, it's not like you're, you're going to take a thousand dollars and invest it in stocks and hope to get your thousand plus gains back. I mean, if you're paying tax, you're, you're paying tax. It's just when are you paying it and at what rate are you paying it? So it's, you know, it's, it's all about the rate. It's not the, about the amount of tax you pay uh, because if you go by amount of tax you pay, Roth is going to win every time. Uh, because you pay a little bit of tax now, and after, you know, let's say it's grown tenfold, well, you're going to pay 10 times the amount of tax later, even if it's at the same rate, but it ends up being the same amount after tax. So looking at the amount of tax paid is just, just not the right way to look at it. You've got to look at the tax rates. And the so the traditional versus Roth wiki, has, there's, there's a common misconceptions section. That's the second one. The second one is the one that says, look at the amount of tax paid. No, that, that's a misconception. And the first one, first misconception is that you get to save at a marginal rate, but you only pay at, a, at your effective rate. No, you don't get to start from zero on, on every single with withdrawal so but the that section of the, the Roth versus traditional wiki covers the those those two common misconceptions one favors Roth one favors traditional but neither one is correct <laughs>